Perfect. So I'm, I'm super happy to be here to talk to you about, you know, one of the subjects that fascinates me, which is sleep and sleep health. So thank you so much for inviting me and hopefully we're all going to learn something today. This is today's agenda. First off, we're going to review what normal sleep looks like, because it's important for us to have an understanding of what normal sleep looks like before we start talking about things that are abnormal with sleep and steps to take to improve it. After review of normal sleep, we're going to talk about sleep breathing disorders and how they can mimic ADHD symptoms. Subsequently, we're going to talk about something that affects many people in society, which is insomnia, you know, a problem falling asleep or staying asleep. And after that, we're going to talk about things that can affect older folks that involve complex nighttime sleep behaviors. We're going to finish off with a question and answer period, and I'm happy to take on whatever questions you may have about my presentation or just any, any general topic relating to sleep. So two, three, and four have to do with sleep as it pertains to people across lifespan. So two is going to involve folks that are young. Three is going to involve adults, and then four is going to involve the elderly. So first off, a review of normal sleep. Why do we sleep? You know, sleep is one of the most crucial bodily processes that we all engage in. So most folks will spend a third of their lifetimes engaging in sleep. And if we live to about 100 years, which seems to be the average lifespan these days, that's about 33 years of time sleeping. So it's important for us to maximize and optimize this period of time in our lives. So what does sleep do? We know that it has to do with growth, memory consolidation and learning, as well as energy conservation. And it's absolutely crucial to, to life. There's a very rare medical condition called fatal familial insomnia, where folks cannot sleep due to a prion disease of the brain. And we know that in folks who have prolonged periods of no sleep because of disease, that it can prove mortal. You can pass away from not having enough sleep. So this is something that's important to all of us, and we all engage in it. I'm, I'm not showing you this slide here to, to stress you out. You don't have to memorize any of the numbers or what these brain waves look like. I'm just drawing to your attention that by reading the brain waves of a person that's both awake and asleep, we can discern if the person has fallen asleep and what stage of sleep that they go into. And sleep medicine as a discipline was truly started maybe in 1953 when a fellow by the name of Dr. Nathaniel Kleitman at the University of Chicago, him and a graduate student of his, discovered REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, which is the time and night that's associated with dreaming and vivid dreams. And basically, what they saw was that when folks slept, there were certain parts of the night where the eyes rolled left and right under the closed eyelids, and they thought there must be something to this. There's something different about this stage of sleep and other stages of sleep. So they had the brilliant idea of putting leads with a toothpaste that's an adhesive on the scalp of the head to read the brain waves. And what they found was that there's different types of stages of sleep, and they're all discernible by distinct patterns in the brain waves. So basically on the far right here, you see the different brain wave readings of the different parts of sleep. At the top here, you have a person who's awake with their eyes open. And you'll know that the brain is truly engaged in, in processing so many stimuli, you're seeing things, you're hearing things, you're reacting to things, you have emotions, and the brain wave activity is super fast. And you'll see that per unit time here, that there's a, a lot of cycles, a lot of polariza depolarizations and repolarizations. So the distance between each uptick is very short. The brain wave activity is very fast. And of course, as, as you're trying to fall asleep and you're still awake but your eyes are closed, the brain wave activity is still very fast, but it's a bit slower than what you are having when you're awake with your eyes open. And as you enter stage one and stage two, which are different forms of light sleep, you'll see the brainwave activity slows even more so. And in delta sleep or slow wave sleep, you'll see that brainwave activity is the slowest. There's a huge distance between this point and this point. So the brain is actually very much in rest in delta sleep and it occupies a special space because 
that's the time when your body releases the bulk of its growth hormone. And in your younger days, you might be growing taller vertically. And we're done growing vertically. It's involved in muscle and bone repair. And we like to think that it shovels away the wastes of the brain that's accumulated during the course of a 24 hour day. At the bottom here, REM sleep, that's when your, your brain is dreaming. And of course, you'll notice what's interesting is that the brainwave activity in a person that's dreaming looks quite similar to a person who's awake with their eyes open. You'll see that the brainwave activity is very fast. And it's because when you're dreaming, your brain is actually creating all these different types of scenarios, characters, situations, emotions. And that's why they called REM sleep at the beginning. The alternate name for it was paradoxical sleep. It looked like the person was awake because the brain waves look similar to a person who's awake with their eyes open, but they were actually asleep. And the only difference between wakefulness and REM sleep was that outside of the brain wave activity, the body is completely paralyzed in dream sleep, but the eyes can still move. And, and, and that's the difference. So it, it's very interesting that we can discern the different types of stages of sleep. And that's, this is what birth sleep medicine is a science. So I mentioned at the beginning that sleep is involved with learning and memory consolidation. So on the left here, we have some cats that are doing learning, declarative learning. So declarative learning has to do with memorization of facts. You know, how much catnip can I buy with $5 if the catnip is only $250 per package? So that's maybe what the cat on the left side is trying to, to, to learn and, and memorize the list of prices at different shops that sell catnip. That kind of declarative learning is associated with slow wave sleep or delta sleep. This kind of sleep right here. On the right hand side, we have Keyboard Cat, who's famous for belting out great piano tunes. Procedural learning has to do with learning maybe physical movements, like how to play a guitar, how to play a piano how to drive a certain route if you're, if you're, you know, you take on a new job and you have to figure out how to get there. This is associated with REM sleep. So you'll see that not only does sleep have a role to play in growth, but also with learning. Basically, during the course of a night, a quarter of the time that you're sleeping, you're going to be in dream sleep or REM sleep, and the rest of the time you're in non-REM sleep. Non-REM sleep includes the deep sleep or what they call delta sleep or slow wave sleep. And you'll see that across all continents, all types of folks and people of all cultures, that REM sleep dominates the second half of your night. And we remember that intuitively it makes sense because most of us will wake up in the morning coming out of a dream. And of course you take your shower and you forget about it. The first half or third of the night is dominated by slow wave sleep or deep sleep. So that's how the structure of sleep occurs throughout the night. You go from light sleep to deep sleep to dreaming, back to light sleep, back to deep sleep, back to dreaming. And you might have four or five cycles of this. And across cultures and people, there's a pattern to it. So we know that on average, the first dream episode that people have occurs 90 minutes after the initiation of your sleep. And deviations from that can be representative of illness or disorders. So what drives sleep? What are the things that push us to sleep more or early or late? Sleep physiologists have identified two processes. The first one has to do with sleep homeostasis. And that's a simple concept. For some of us who, who choose to work long hours or you know, they work as nurses or, or, or folks that do long shifts, you'll know that it makes perfect sense that the longer you stay awake, the sleepier you become. And that's this, the process S, the sleep homeostatic drive. The longer you're awake, the more sleepy you become. And of course, sleeping quenches that sleepiness and upon awakening, you're fully alert again. And then on that second day, if you choose to be up for 20 hours, you're going to feel very, very sleepy. The second process that affects our sleepiness during the course of the day has to do with our circadian rhythm or internal body clock. And it's a very interesting thing. It, it's located in the suprachiasmic nuclei of our brain. 
And there's a neural hormone that is the main controller of the circadian rhythm. It's called melatonin. And basically, the internal body clock controls a series of bodily processes, some of which I've listed here in this diagram. And it matches up to the light dark cycle of the external environment. So basically, when it's light out, we should feel more alert. And when it's dark out or getting dark, we should feel more sleepy. And you'll see here that alertness is highest at 10 a.m. Your coordination is best in the early afternoon, your reaction time as well. And different other different bodily processes you can see are, are controlled by the internal body clock. So there's a tendency for us to be sleeping when it's dark out and a tendency for us to be alert when it's light out. What happens to sleep across the lifespan, you know, as we age? You know, for those of us who have children, you'll know that newborns sleep almost all the day. They need a lot of sleep, and it has to do with growth and also their brain organization. The brain is reorganizing itself, learning, learning how to react to stimuli, learning how to speak, learning how to eat. All those things require a lot of sleep. So newborns need a lot of hours of sleep, and as we age and growth starts to slow, you'll see that our total sleep time, the minimum required total sleep time decreases across lifespan. So a person who's 16 years old, the bare minimum that they need is gonna be eight hours of sleep. So they recommend eight to 10 hours of sleep for folks who are in their teenage years. You move on to age ages 33 to 45, and the bare minimum that they need is gonna be about seven hours. They recommend seven to nine. And unfortunately, once we get into the, you know, the, the elderly age range, let's say after 65, there's a tendency for a vast reduction of our ability to sustain sleep. So as we age, it takes longer for us to fall asleep. We have more middle of night awakenings. And it's harder for us to stay alert during the daytime. And hence, older folks have a tendency to maybe nap during the daytime to compensate for the lower amount of sleep that they get at night. What's also interesting about the changes in our sleep patterns as we go down the lifespan, young folks have a tendency to sleep late and wake up late, and that's built in. That's built in as, you know, in human beings, in primates. Teenagers have a tendency to sleep late and wake up late, which is why a lot of sleep doctors, including myself, we advocate to change the start time of high school to, to, to be later. Because if a person has to attend homeroom at 8.30 in the morning, but their internal body clock is telling them to, to still be kind of sleepy, then they might not be learning the best that they can, right? And as we go down the age range and you know move into like the elderly range, there's a tendency to sleep earlier and wake up earlier. This is what we call a physiologic phase advance such that we all know grandparents that sleep very early and wake up very early. An example would be some, uh, you know, grandma who sleeps at 8 p.m. and wakes up at 4.30 in the morning. You know, that's natural. That's, that's something that's built into us as human beings. So in summary, sleep is a central and crucial part of life. If we read the brain waves of a person that's asleep, we can discern the differences between sleep stages and we divide up sleep into non-REM sleep and dream sleep. The drive to sleep is governed by homeostasis, how long we've been up for, and also our circadian rhythm. And that with aging, our sleep architecture and patterns of sleep do change. So that's, that's a nice overview of normal sleep. And now you know just about as much as I do on that subject. So moving on, we're gonna look at sleep issues that affect young folks. So sleep breathing disorders, can they mimic ADHD? And if I ask that as a question, the answer is actually yes, of course it can, and it does. So first off, I wanna talk about a brief overview of what ADHD is. So it affects 7.2% of children worldwide and adults, slightly lower, anywhere between two and a half percent to maybe close to 7%. And exact a significant problem for children and adults. So if you're a young person, and, and you have ADHD and, and you're not paying attention in school or you're fidgety or you're impulsive, teachers can, can you know, 
feel like they're not focusing enough on their teaching material and, and that might change the trajectory of, of a person's life and appropriately so. You know, a person has a medical condition that's affecting their ability to concentrate at school. And, and we want young folks to do the best they can in school and, you know, go into whatever uh, career that they want to do. So, so it's important that if a young person has ADHD, this, get, this gets identified and treated well. And same thing with adults. If you're having trouble with attention and impulsivity, it might be hard to get a job that you like and maybe hang on to that job that you already have. Long story short, you have to have an, atten an attention symptom, and that could be, you know, uh, having trouble holding attention to tasks or play activities, not, not seeming to listen when you're spoken to, often losing things necessary for tasks and activities, things like school materials, pencils, wallets, and then, of course, hyperactivity and impulsivity. So in young folks, there might be a tendency for the person to fidget with their hands and feet. They might stand up impulsively they might blurt out answers to a question that a teacher is asking they might interrupt your speaking turn and of course these symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity have to, have to happen in at least two or more settings so if a, a young person just simply dislikes school so much that they act up in school but they're fine at home that doesn't mean that they have adhd it has to happen in two different settings and of course a disorder isn't a disorder if it doesn't cause you some social or academic or work related problem sorry that's a typo that should be work related problem and the symptoms have to be present before age 12 because our conception of adhd our understanding of it is that it's a developmental disorder and of course as with all conditions uh it can't be better accounted for by another psychiatric diagnosis so in that criteria i didn't review it for fun you'll notice that there isn't an exclusion for another medical condition. So a lot of conditions in our psychiatric Bible, the DSM, they say that the symptoms can't be better explained by another medical condition. And we know in the last 20 years, a lot of research has gone into identifying that there is an overlap between what we call sleep disorder breathing and ADHD symptoms, leading to inattention and impulsivity and hyperactivity. And here we have a, a selection of young cats that have impulsivity and hyperactivity. So the bottom line is sleep disordered breathing can mimic the symptoms of ADHD. So what is sleep disordered breathing? It represents the continuum between snoring and sleep apnea. So snoring is when the airways leading to your lungs are still patent, they're still open, and air can still fl flow through but there's some turbulence in the air and the turbulence leads to sounds, leads to snoring. You know, sometimes it can be, you know, a small, you know, soothing trill of a bird, but it can also be like as loud as a train uh, uh, coming by. So snoring represents the more benign side of sleep disorder breathing. But once you get into a situation where the airways close completely, leading to a drop in oxygen and blood or a partial closure of the airways. And I have a diagram here on the right hand side that shows the situation and what can happen in a young person with large adenoids and tonsils. This closure of the airway can lead to disrupted sleep and drops in oxygen, which cause health issues and can cardiovascular risks. The nighttime symptoms include things like snoring, gasping or choking. And if you're a parent, you might see some pauses in your child's breathing. So these are the nighttime symptoms of sleep disorder breathing or sleep apnea. The thing is, the nighttime symptoms end up translating to daytime concerns, things like hyperactivity, inattention, daytime sleepiness, mem memory problems, word recall problems, not doing well in school, aggressivity, impulsivity, and oppositional behaviors. So how does how does that relate? How is it that a person that just has difficulties breathing, their airways might be closing every now and then at night, how does that translate to all these behavioral issues and cognitive issues the next day? Well, they are related because nighttime sleep disruption and fragmentation and drops in oxygen actually cause your brain to have to wake up any number of times to restart the breathing. That's the bottom line. That's why those things are connected. So on the right-hand side here, I have a diagram that explains this 
in a way that's easy to understand. So at the top here, a person is gonna, a young person is gonna fall asleep. And as you fall asleep, it's axiomatic. We know this, that when we sleep, when we fall asleep, our breathing and effort in breathing is less than what it is when we're awake. You know, the muscles are more relaxed. So it sets up the stage for the airways to collapse and close. Sometimes because of gravity and in combination with tonsils and adenoids. The airways close because of that. You have a cessation in breathing, which is called an apnea. That's just a fancy term to say that the airways are completely closed and there's no air going through to your lungs. And of course, if there's no air going to your lungs, your blood oxygen levels are going to drop and your brain detects that. It's going to freak out a bit because we need oxygen to survive. And all our organs in our body, they just need oxygen to, 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 to survive and live, right? And our brain uses about 50% of the oxygen that we inhale. So when it detects this drop in oxygen, as part of the process to restart the breathing, your brain has to wake up for a split second. So these aren't awakenings that we would routinely be aware of, but of course our brain keeps track of it, to restart the breathing. And it's those awakenings that lead to these behavioral issues. And that's how the nighttime breathing issues can tie to brain concerns and behavioral concerns the next day. So when we look at young folks, age two to eight, up to 10% of them can have sleep apnea and snoring is present up to almost a third of all children. And these numbers are continuously increasing with time. For the reason, you know, the world is basically our lifestyles are improving. And as part of that, we're, we're having higher caloric intake, meaning that maybe we're eating, you know, more calorie dense meals. The adoption of the Western diet across the world has led to increases in weight and increases in weight and overweight and obesity are associated with sleep apnea because some of the weight that you gain make the airways smaller. So unfortunately, apnea will only affect more young people increasingly with time. When we look into the science of it, because there's this overlap between the symptoms of untreated sleep apnea in young people and ADHD, many studies have been done to see what the association was. And, and there's a, a statistically significant association between untreated sleep apnea in children and ADHD symptoms. And up to a third of young people with sleep apnea will have the symptoms of ADHD. So there, 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 there's, this creates a situation where we might make the mistake of assuming that the ADHD symptoms is purely from a development about developmental disorder and not the sleep breathing disorder. And appropriate diagnosis drives appropriate treatment. And that's the important thing here. So just more data looking at sleep apnea and learning. Young folks who snored loudly when they were two to six later on had worse academic performance as they entered high school. And we know how important high school is for a, a young person's trajectory in terms of academics and career in the future. IQ is affected. IQ is lower in young folks with sleep apnea and obesity. And that Sleep apnea in a young person predicts worse learning and memory. And when you look at the performance of the lowest performing 10% of students in grade one, there seems to be a six to nine times greater presence of sleep apnea in, in those folks. And if they got surgery to treat their sleep apnea, their grades and the severity of their ADHD scores improve. So why am I talking about surgery? Well, surgery happens to be the first line or you know, the first treatment that we try with young people with sleep apnea. And basically, a young person's airways can be dominated by the presence of adenoids and tonsils in their size, which blocks the airways. And by taking those structures out, we make the airways bigger and it's harder for the airways to collapse. And in very well-designed studies, which I've listed here, they found that the effect of surgery was equivalent. It, it, it wasn't any worse than giving the patient Ritalin, which we all know to be the standard treatment for ADHD. So once again, accurate diagnosis potentiates accurate treatment. And if a person is a young person and they have sleep apnea and we're giving them still the medications like Ritalin, like Adderall, then we're, we're potentially subjecting them to unnecessary adverse, event, adverse side effects, things that I've listed here, things like insomnia, 
decreased appetite and delayed growth, headaches, stomach aches, rebound irritability when they're not taking the medication, ticks, as well as moodiness. So when we see a person that's a young person that might have obesity or overweight, that snore at night and have ADHD symptoms, they should be definitely screened for presence of sleep apnea. And if present, the sleep apnea should be dealt with before you consider giving them stimulant medications because those things have side effects. And from studying this, we know that the treatment, the appropriate treatment of the sleep apnea may reduce and eliminate the need for psychotropic medications. So that's the point to consider for young folks. Moving on, moving on to adults, how to fight insomnia. So yesterday, last night, actually, I was just looking up online as I'm wont to do at home, just looking up insomnia uh, to see what's out there in the news. And look at this, we have here an article, uh, you'll see that's Monday, April 18th, 2022. Jennifer Aniston's insomnia is just her latest sleep issue. So right now, as it stands currently, insomnia, which is a problem, falling asleep, staying asleep or waking up too early, is the most common sleep problem in society at, at, at any given time. So, so what does insomnia mean here? It's a problem in the nighttime. So a problem falling asleep, staying asleep or waking up too early. And obviously it's gonna cause you some sort of daytime dysfunction for it to be a disorder. So if your nighttime sleep issues create issues with you during the day in terms of work and school, and there's always a duration criteria for diagnostics. So in this case, you have to have these symptoms that are present for three nights a week for three months. Insomnia is often comorbid with medical and psychiatric illness and exerts a significant functional and quality of life sequelae. This is a nice study out of Laval University where they looked at the cost to society. How much does insomnia cost society? And they looked at direct costs, right? Like, you know, if a patient has problems falling asleep or staying asleep and they go to the doctors, how much is the government paying the doctors to see these patients with insomnia? How much are the patients directly paying for medications or therapy that treats insomnia? And they looked at also indirect costs, things like a person who's sleepy because they don't sleep well at night, how much, how less, how much less productivity they have at work the next day. Sometimes it means that they're missing work. Sometimes it means that they're at work, but they're not working as well as they should. So the cost to, to the province of Quebec was found to be $6.6 .6 billion a year. And that's a huge public health issue. And you'll see here that the costs are worse with people who meet full criteria for insomnia disorder, you know, problems falling asleep, staying asleep or waking up too early for three times a week for three months straight. And even in the patients that don't meet criteria for insomnia disorder, the cost of society and these indirect and indirect costs is still massive compared to good sleepers. So this is a insomnia is a is a really a big public health issue that deserves more consideration and more attention from my perspective. So how much of this is out there? If you have a nighttime symptom, it's about a third of all folks at any given time. If you add to that a daytime impairment secondary to the nighttime issues, that's about 10 to 15% of all people. And then furthermore, if you add a duration criteria, something like, you know, the symptoms being present for three times a week for three months, that's about six to 10% of folks. That's one in 10 people almost. So this is a big problem. And I mentioned that it's associated with psychiatric illness. We know that sleep has a bi-directional relationship with psychiatric and mental health symptoms and disorders. If you have bad sleep, you're much more likely to have depression and anxiety and vice versa. And of course, if you have medical illness, you're much more likely to develop insomnia. On, the, on this graph here, you'll see that this table shows a gamut of different medical issues spanning from heart disease, to cancer, to breathing issues, to urinary issues. And in all cases, your likelihood of developing insomnia or having insomnia when you have these medical conditions is rather high. So this affects a whole range of folks dealing with all sorts of medical conditions. Now, the absolute best way to treat insomnia is something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It's been studied thousands of times, and we know that it's equally as effective, if not better than any sleeping pill in existence, that's one, 
Number two, when, when people complete the course, generally speaking, the insomnia doesn't come back. And for those reasons, CBT for insomnia is the best treatment for problems falling asleep, staying asleep or waking up too early. And independent of its benefits to your sleep, it's been shown to reduce depression symptoms. So it has antidepressant effect. The problem with CBT for insomnia is that there is an extremely high demand for this, but very low supply. Very few people, very few doctors, very few therapists uh, deliver this kind of treatment. So there's a gap between supply and demand. And, and hence, unfortunately, a lot of folks don't get access to this and they end up taking sleeping medications. So I wanna show you guys how to do this in your own homes. I'm gonna show you a step-by-step, -step, a seven-step plan to do cognitive behavioral therapy for yourselves. Long story short, there's five components. There's sleep restriction, stimulus control, relaxation based on interventions, cognitive restructuring, and sleep hygiene. But when, as with all therapies, a lot of effort has been put in to see if we can simplify it, to make it more accessible to the masses. And it transpires that the first two components is the main meat of this therapy. One thing I wanna bring up is that basic sleep hygiene by itself has not been shown by itself to be effective in, in treating chronic insomnia. So if you have these components done already, you know, good sleep hygiene, that doesn't necessarily mean that your insomnia will go away. Most good sleepers will have good sleep hygiene, but just because you develop good sleep hygiene doesn't mean that your insomnia will go away. So that's the point I'm trying to make. But here I have the points here. Avoid smoking several hours before bed. Avoid drinking alcohol or caffeine several hours before bed. Exercise regularly, that's gonna be good for your sleep overall, but don't do it too close to your bedtime because you're gonna be amped up and it's gonna be hard for you to fall asleep. And of course, keep your sleeping quarters quiet, cool and dark and keep a regular sleep schedule. So this is the part that's easy. I think most of us have an understanding of this. This next part is the seven step program for success to treat insomnia. It's a simplified version of sleep restriction and stimulus control. So first off, I want you, if you have insomnia, to track your sleep for two weeks straight every night. Just write down on a sheet of paper when you go to bed, how long it took for you to fall asleep, how many times you woke up in the middle of the night and for how long and why, and when you wake up in the morning. And what you wanna do is you wanna take that total pre-existing sleep time and half the time that you're awake while you're trying to sleep while you're in bed and use that to calculate your sleep window. That's how, much, how many hours you're allowed to be actually physically be in bed. So one example is if you're a person with insomnia, there's gonna be a definite period of time, maybe one or two hours when you're wide awake, but trying to sleep, right? So as an example, if it takes you one hour to fall asleep and you're up in the middle of the night for one hour, but you're only sleeping for six hours of the eight hours total, then using this, this uh, calculation here, then your sleep window is seven hours in bed because you're, you're up, it took you an hour to fall asleep. You're up for an hour in the middle of the night. So th those are two hours that you're not sleeping while you're lying in bed and you're only sleeping six hours. So you take the two hours, divide by two and you add that to the, the time you're actually asleep. And that's your sleep window in bed. And then every week thereafter, you can increase or reduce your time in bed by 15 to 30 minute, minute increments until you're sleeping for about 85% of the time that you're lying down in bed, okay? And you do this by changing your bedtime and not your wake time. It's important, it's so important for, for everybody to wake up every day at about the same time because your wake time is a proxy to your exposure, your first exposure to bright light, sunlight, or the lights in your home. And that first exposure to your to bright light upon awakening starts your internal body clock 24 hour cycle. So if you wake up every day at different times, you're giving yourself an artificial jet lag. Okay, so wake up every day at the same time, your bedtime can change from night to night, but only go to bed when you're feeling sleepy. So I know a lot of folks will, will think, okay, it's important for me to sleep every day at the, at the same time and wake up every day at the same time, but that's gonna be very hard and it's a recipe for insomnia for the reason, depending on what you did during the daytime, if you're working out for two or three hours or you had like a really involved day where you had to do you know mentally strenuous exercise and things like that, you're gonna be sleepier on those days compared to days where you're more relaxed, where you're just taking it easy. Right, so, so when you go to bed might change from day to day, but you should wake up every day at the same time. 
The next step would be no naps during the daytime whatsoever, because whatever time you nap during the day, that gets taken out of your nighttime sleep. Your brain does a really good job of tracking how much sleep you do in 24 hours. And then lastly, if you're up in the middle of the night and you, it's, it feels like it's been a long time, you can't go back to sleep, don't just stay in bed. Get up out of bed, go to a different room that's dimly lit and do something boring, like a word search. Because sleep is subject to conditioning. Conditioning just dictates that if we have bad sleep for several days in a row, we're more likely to have bad sleeps thereafter because your brain is used to the idea that you're wide awake in bed. And we want to break that association. We want to decondition you from associating your bed with wakefulness. So that's why if you're up in the middle of the night, feels like a long time, leave the bedroom, do something boring, and then go back when you have that head nodding feeling that signifies sleepiness. So in summary, insomnia is a widespread problem. It's associated with medical, lots of different medical conditions. Cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is the first line treatment and not medications. And I showed you today a seven step program that helps you, you know, treat insomnia in a quick and easy way. Moving on to the last part of the didactic portion of, of today's session, things that go bump in the night. And this, this is something that affects the elderly. So I'm gonna show you a video. What you saw there was an elderly person acting out their dreams. So there's lots of different nighttime complex movement and behaviors that a person can do. And of course, if you're a parent and, and, you, and you know, you've had young children come in and out of your lives, you'll know that a lot of them, up to maybe a third of young people aged 12 and below, will have sleepwalking and sleep talking episodes. And, and you'll know that that is largely benign. You know, nothing will happen to you in the long term, usually. Folks outgrow sleepwalking and sleep talking with the tincture of time. This is a different condition. This is called REM sleep behavior disorder. And the crux of the issue is that these are folks who, instead of being paralyzed when they dream, which I told you, you know, in dream sleep, all of us were paralyzed and there's very, we, we don't move our muscles when we dream. These are people who have lost that paralysis and dream sleep. So they, when they dream and whatever they're doing in their dream, they're acting out. And this can involve things like speaking and screaming or punching and kicking, depending on the nature of the dreams. And if we do a sleep study in these folks, we can see that there's a loss of that paralysis, a loss of that loss of paralysis in sleep, in dream sleep, okay? So it affects one in 2000 people and affects more males than females, and it, and it seems to affect folks who, who tend to be older. So I mentioned that, you know, there's different things, nighttime complex sleep behaviors. We have, you know, sleepwalking, sleep talking that tends to affect younger folks, which is largely benign, and we have this acting out of dreams. How do we differentiate the two? Well, the clinical history that you take is gonna be important, right? Or, or things that you're considering. Do these complex sleep behaviors happen in the second half of the night? So I showed you at the beginning of this talk, there's a slide that shows you that most of us have more dream sleep during the second half of the night as opposed to the first half. So if the behaviors or the vocalizations happen during the second half of the night, you're more likely dealing with this REM sleep behavior disorder. And for the folks, for the parents out there that have dealt with young children that have had sleepwalking, sleep talking, you'll know that when you try to wake them up, it's actually very, very difficult to do so. And it takes them maybe 20 to 30 minutes to even come to. Whereas in this case, in REM sleep behavior disorder, if you wake them up, they'll rouse almost immediately and they'll be quick to orient to where they are as opposed to sleepwalking, sleep talking, where first of all, it takes you 20 to 30 minutes to get them to, to come to. And when they come to, they might not even know where they are. And lastly, they, they remember that they were dreaming and doing some physical behaviors that correspond to their dreams. 
And if you answer yes to these questions, you might have REM sleep behavior disorder. So one easy one question ask that we that we can you know give ourselves and or the people that we know that might have this issue is simply to ask, have you ever been told or suspected yourself that you seem to act out your dreams while asleep? For example, punching, flailing your arms in the air, or making running movements. And that seems to be a pretty accurate and reliable way to find out if a person is acting out their dreams and having this REM sleep behavior disorder. And I mentioned that if we do a sleep study, we're going to see the loss of paralysis and REM. So, you know, this is an output from a sleep study in a person that has no REM sleep behavior disorder. My point here, I'm just showing you this here, the chin lead, which is just the detection of the muscle movements of the chin. There's no movement of the chin muscle whatsoever during REM sleep. And we know this is REM sleep because of the brain waves. Plus, up here, this shows the rapid eye movements represented by the quick squiggles of the eyes. So this is REM sleep, and the, the person has paralysis and REM. This is a person that has REM sleep behavior disorder. They're acting out their dreams. The chin lead, you'll see, has a very noisy signal, and there's lots of fuzziness and ups and downs compared to this flat, straight line here and the person that doesn't have REM sleep behavior disorder. That's a loss of the paralysis that we, we should all have in dream sleep. And this disproportionately affects older males. And, you know, what are your risks of, you know, developing REM sleep behavior disorder? Well, it has to do with things like a history of head injury, working in farming, pesticide exposure, fewer years of education. And the consequences, and the reason why I'm bringing this up to you guys as, as a topic of concern, not only can it cause, you know, injuries to bed partners and injuries to the person themselves, if they, should they fall off their bed or get up out of bed and injure themselves in some way. Acting out your dreams on a regular basis might be a precursor to the development of neurological disease, in particular, what we call alpha synucleopathies. And they all have a component of a movement disorder like Parkinson's disease, where the movements of your body become slowed and difficult. Your face becomes masked. It's hard for you to make facial expressions. Your voice gets lower in volume. Your writing gets smaller and smaller. And, and your, the way that you walk is really stiff. This, Acting out of dreams seems to be a precursor to development of Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, and multiple, multiple system atrophy. And in, in, in studies out of a group at the University of Minnesota, where they were the first folks to, to, to see these patients, 81% developed Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease, or multiple system atrophy after about 14 years of having the dream and acting behavior. And cross-sectionally, acting out of dreams can be found in up to half of folks with Parkinson's disease, up to 80% of people with Lewy body dementia, and up to 95% of people with multiple system atrophy. And this acting out of dreams leads to worse prognosis if the person were to develop Parkinson's disease, and I've listed some of the things that they might experience there. In folks with Lewy body dementia, if you act out your dreams, you might have earlier movement disorders. You might have more early onset of visual hallucinations. You treat this with melatonin and, and sometimes clonazepam. You want to tell the bed partners to be safe to make sure they don't get injured based on the movements of the, of the patient. But this represents a very unique opportunity because all the treatments that we have for Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia and multiple system atrophy have to do with reducing the symptoms. They don't change the onset or the course. There is tremendous work being done right now in, in a worldwide consortium that I've put here on the slide, led by Dr. Ron Postuma at McGill University, where they're looking at experimental treatments that may be able to delay the onset of Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, and multiple system atrophy. So instead of just treating the symptoms of these neurological illnesses, this is an opportunity for us to see if we can find an agent that will delay or even prevent the onset of these illnesses. And it's associated with the patients that act out their dreams. So if you know somebody that has this, you know, this is a time to, to seek medical care. It affects older folks, but it's also hopeful. You know, we have a chance to change the course of a person's illness trajectory. So I think that was a lot of information. I've touched upon 
things that affect young people, adults, and the elderly. And I'm happy to take whatever questions you may have. Thank you.